sure that you don't come to an agreement, you don't resolve the issue, you don't make the deal. All of us, I don't care what you do. I want them to pick up the phone when I call them again. I want them to return my email when I call them again. And because we are all, regardless of where we are, we're all in very small communities. If you don't think your reputation is gonna get ahead of you, you're fooling yourself. And so even though we don't make a deal, I want them to say, hey, Chris and I talked for about two hours the other day. We didn't get anywhere. I thought we were gonna make a deal. Didn't work out. But the guy listened. He respected my point of view. We just didn't align. And if anything happens in the future and the planets line up, I'd love to do business with them again. That's what you want coming out of the people that you don't strike up a deal with. And, and that attitude, that mantra, if you guys don't have that in your head right now, sending them home in a limousine, you're doing yourself a disservice. Because the flip side of that is you don't come to a deal or an agreement, you make them feel cruddy. What are they going to do? What are they going to do for your future business? And they're going to, and they're going to sabotage you. They're going to, revenge is a powerful motivator. And they're, they're going to say, you know what, Johnny made me feel like crap. So the next time somebody calls me and says, hey, I, I heard you talk to Derek the other day, and, uh, and uh, I heard you talk to Johnny the other day, and, and what was your thoughts? And I'm going to be frank with him. I'm going to let him know Johnny made me feel like crap. I'm going to cause Johnny pain. The same kind of pain that he caused me in the midst of that conversation now is my opportunity to exact my revenge. So just be careful with that. Adapt that mindset, send them home in a limo. Yes, that's the sequencing of any black swan communication. Tactical empathy first, your goal and objective comes last, always. And as a part of that deference process, you wanna hear what they have to say first. They've thought about it. And so everybody that I coach individually one of the lead labels that they use at the beginning of the conversation is it seems like you have a vision for what this is going to look like moving forward. That's you seeding the conversation. You're giving it over to them. Tell me what is on your mind without saying those words. Seems like you have a vision for what this is going to look like moving forward. And then what are you going to do with their response? Mirror. Label it, mirror it, paraphrase it. You hear things that support your position, hang a label on it, make it stronger. You hear something that they're concerned about, hang a label on it, get rid of it. But you're gonna label me or paraphrase whatever response you get to that vision question until you're satisfied that you've beaten it up enough. And then we transition the conversation into, here's what we were thinking. Where does it line up, where does it diverge? And then, ultimately, does that divergence lead us to an agreement, a subsequent conversation, or, or no deal at all? But to Sandy's point, this, the word specifically, vision, I specifically say you, I don't care what it sounds like, as long as it's got that word vision in there, because vision drives decision. Now, what if they can't give you a robust response to that? If I say to you, sounds like you got a vision for how this is going to work out. And you're like, yeah, I don't know. What were you thinking? Is that a problem? Well, you, need, you should be prepared with your own vision, but if they don't have one, is that a problem? Yeah. By the time they engage you, most of them are, they're well down the road of their decision-making process. So if they're telling me that they don't have a vision with what our partnership is going to look like going forward, Am I the fool or the favorite in that game? I'm concerned if I ask that vision label and I don't get the appropriate response. Sorry about that. Remember, you don't get in life what's fair. You get what you negotiate. If you want to become a better negotiator, click the link in the description below. This dynamic silence stuff is an outlier. You shut up in the conversation and you're going to discombobulate the other side because they're not used to it. They're used to people dominating the conversation over them, so when you go silent, it's gonna, it's gonna mess with their wiring, and they may not know how to respond, and this is just a little 
a little nudge to say, it's okay. You can go ahead and talk. So keep that in mind. Yes, ma'am. So I was just thinking it kind of goes against every sales trick that you've been taught. Yep. Like every sales 101. Yep. Don't tell them you've done the wrong thing. Don't take the back step. Don't get, don't let them get away from the sales. So you don't want to say, oh, I'm, I've, I've, I did the wrong thing. You know, you still want to try and hone in on that sale. So it seems like you're flipping it. We're flipping it very completely. Much flipping this it. is why we're, we're making you that outlier. Do you know why? Because every other sales training that you've had, she's had, she's had, he's had, and you all come in selling like the same. There's no difference in you. And so taking the time to do this stuff is a great way for you to convey to the other side, you're as, if not more important than me in this conversation. You're fulfilling a need, a human nature need that all of us have. And so because all of you all are trained alike, except you've got black swan training, unconsciously I'm going to gravitate to you over these, over these three. So without question, we're flipping everything on its head. It seems, it sounds, it feels like I am failing to be sensitive to something that's in extremely important to you. You're, and this is, this is self-deprecating. You're falling on your sword. You're saying, this is not your problem. This is my problem. I'm failing to be sensitive to what you're going through. And that's enough. That's usually enough to push them along. The place you want to start is, if you were them, what would you be thinking about you? What would you be thinking about the circumstances? What would you be thinking about the conversation? That's a great place to start. Second place that you can start, I think you did allude to this, is you hear the same things over and over again when you engage prospective clients, what they're going to tell you, your price, your terms, impact, et cetera. Another great place to start. You already have a built-in list of accusations audits that you know everybody that I talk to in this circumstance comes to me and says and provides pushback on this, that, or, or the, the other thing. So what you want to do is start with, if I were them, what would I be thinking about me? And then what, is, what are the common pushbacks, objections, hesitations, reluctances, no's that I get on a regular basis? And then you're going to want to formulate those lists as a part of your preparation because you're going to lead with that in the conversation. Wait, I'm going to start the conversation with the negative opinions, assumptions, and impressions that they have about me? That's exactly what I'm telling you to do. This is proactive, remember. What are we trying to do at the end of the day? Shut up, Sandy. What are we trying to do? So, um, I, wasn't, I actually had a question just about okay. the language you were using. Okay, hold on one second. We'll, we will definitely we're get to that. We're diffusing the negative, but why? It, it earns trust, but what else is it doing for the counterpart? You're make, exactly, you're getting them positive. You're making them smarter. Because as we're pushing through this conversation, what do I want them thinking about? The conversation, not all the stuff that they hate about me. And if I don't take care of it at the beginning of the conversation, what are they doing as I'm talking? They're, they're just, they're just they're, half of their brain is offline. You are actually dealing with the schizophrenic because they're listening to their own internal monologue and they're trying to listen to you. And so that's why we preemptively go out, go after it to take permission and authority away from them from using that against you during the course of the conversation. You're trying to clear up their brain. And I'm gonna tell you, this is the most counterintuitive. You're gonna have a big problem with this. Sally alluded to it before she left. It's uncomfortable. You're taking a negative light and you're pointing it back at you, the circumstances, your organization. Who does that? It takes a tremendous amount of courage, but the courage that it takes is not lost on your counterpart because they're looking at you and going, I'd never do that. But to Brandon's point, there's no clearer way to show the other side you're dialed in than when you start to articulate stuff that they haven't spoken yet. But our consistent experience in the application of this, and this is one of the shifts that Derek made, elevating the accusations audit even to a more um, effective, is 
you. You probably, you may. You probably, you probably may. 